I, I ripped up my regular uh, introduction of Senator Sanders because I just want to tell this story that we had Senator Sanders here on a Saturday in April, a sunny Saturday in April, probably around 13 or 14. There wasn't much rumor about the fact that he was going to run for president. And I said, oh, my goodness, in New Hampshire on a sunny Saturday in April, everybody's at the beach or the mountains. I was worried. I'm like, how are we going to fill the room? It's going to be embarrassing. He's a senior, you know, he's a United States senator. I don't know what to do. I rode into the parking lot at 7 a.m., two hours beforehand, and I did not have a parking spot. I know how you feel. And it was like a... Grateful Dead, or if you're a young person, a Justin Bieber concert out there. <laughs> there were so many people. The fire marshal threatened to arrest me in here. Um, and Senator Sanders had to go out and address the people who were waiting for him out in the parking lot. But let me tell you what I heard. Uh, there were some really sort of first time radical ideas that I heard uh, on that speech and that he was talking about climate change and he was talking about affordability for college students. He was talking about health care. And it was sort of really different. And uh, now it's not so different. And I couldn't, um, I couldn't be more honored to have uh, this great man coming here today to finish off before our 100th anniversary of our presidential primary, Senator Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Neil, and uh, let me reintroduce my wife, who will make a very great First Lady, Jane Sanders. Um, and also for the media, isn't it nice to go to an event uh, where you're not considered to be an enemy of the people, and you are shown some respect, but I don't want to overdo it. Um, what I want to do this morning is say uh, a few words about what our campaign is about. And it, it really is asking the American people to kind of think outside of the box, to take a look at our country and the world in a different way than Congress does or often than the media does, and to ask some fundamental questions about what is going on in our nation. That's what I'd like to do for a few minutes and maybe kind of suggest to you uh, why we are where we are. Question, President Trump says the economy is doing great, it's booming. Well, let's take a look at the economy today. If you are the average American worker, despite huge increases in technology and productivity over the last 45 years, Today, you are not earning a nickel more in real inflation accounted for dollars than you did 45 years ago. Why is that? I'm much older to think about it. It's a serious question. Technology is exploding. I remember when I was mayor of Burlington, Vermont in the 1980s, we didn't have a computer in City Hall. The world has radically changed, and yet the average American worker today not making a nickel more than he or she did 45 years ago with in inflation accounted for dollars. Today, in the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, we have more income and wealth inequality than we've had in 100 years. Now, again, we don't talk about it. Congress doesn't talk about it. Media doesn't talk about it terribly often. How do we feel when three people in America own more wealth than the bottom half of our country, 160 million people? How do we feel? when the top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 92% at the same time when tonight over 500,000 Americans will be homeless, sleeping out on the streets or in shelters, including 30,000 veterans. When we talk about wages in America and our economy, today in America, half of our people will be living paycheck to paycheck. And I know a little bit about that because I grew up in a family, lived in a rent-controlled apartment in Brooklyn, New York when I was a kid, family that lived paycheck to paycheck. You know what living paycheck to paycheck means? It means that if your car breaks down and you're living in New Hampshire or Vermont and you need 30 to go 30 miles to work, you can't get to work and you can't afford the 500 bucks you need to fill to get your car repaired. Living paycheck to paycheck means if you get sick today, you can't afford 
to go to the doctor because you may have an outrageous deductible or no health insurance at all. When we talk about the economy, Trump talked about it in the State of the Union, please remember that in the last three years, the billionaires in this country saw an over $800 billion increase in their wealth. And yet last year, in this booming economy, the average American worker in inflation accounted for dollars saw a 1% increase in his or her wages. Why is that? How does it happen that year after year after year, people on top do phenomenally well, year after year after year, working class and middle class of this country struggle, and 40 million people live in poverty? Why is that? I, I want to throw that idea. I want you to be thinking about that. In terms of education, we are in a great college right here. Thank them for all the wonderful work they do. In New England, we're proud of the high quality of our higher educational system. But let's look at education. Everybody in this room knows that zero through four are the most important years of human development, intellectually and emotionally. Nobody denies that. Yet we have a dysfunctional health care system, dysfunctional child care system, in which working class families all over this country, in Vermont, in New Hampshire, Cannot, afford, cannot find quality, affordable childcare. And we trust our little kids to people who are paid, in many cases, lower wages than McDonald's workers, who do not have the training and background they should have in order to educate and take care of our little ones. How does it happen? How does it happen that in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, we treat working families and the children with such contempt by not providing them with the best early childhood education that we can. I was in this great state a couple of months ago talking to people in, uh, in education here in, in, in New Hampshire. And the educators told me that right here in this great state, which by no means is one of the poor states in America, you're doing pretty well economically, teachers in New Hampshire in some school districts, I am told, start off at a salary of less than $29,000 a year. Now, what does that say about our society? We can give hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts to baseball players, but we're telling the young people in America, you want to be a teacher, you're going to start off at a salary that you really can't even survive on. And at that same meeting, I'll not forget this, a woman who was an educator, retired, I think, here in New Hampshire, and she said, you know, let me just tell you something. My son graduated college, somewhere around here, and he had a choice. He had a choice of be becoming a music teacher, which is what his training was, or working in a state liquor store. He took the job in the liquor store because it paid him a higher salary than working as a teacher. What does that say about our society, our respect for our kids, and our respect for education? In terms of health care, please understand that what I am proposing, when I talk about Medicare for all, I know you'll see TV ads and everything telling you how radical it is. This is what exists in every other major country on Earth. We're a few hours away or less from our Canadian neighbors. In Canada, if you end up in the hospital with a serious illness, you're there for a month, you come out, you don't pay a bill. You go to any doctor you want, you go to any hospital you want, you don't take out your wallet, you don't take out your credit card, you go to any doctor you want. Now, how does it happen that in Canada they spend 50% per capita of what we spend? We spend twice as much per person on health care as do the people of Canada, <clears throat> and yet we have in America 87 million people who are uninsured or underinsured, 30,000 who die every single year because they don't get to a doctor when they should. A half a million people go bankrupt because of medically related illnesses. Think about the obscenity of a situation where somebody in this room, God forbid, is diagnosed with cancer, is struggling, fighting for their lives. And while you fight for your lives, you've got to worry about your family being in financial ruin. Why is that? Why is that? Why is it that today in America, when the scientists tell us that climate change is an existential threat to our nation and the world. 
that we are fighting for the survival of the planet, why does it happen that you have a fossil fuel industry that receives tens and tens of billions of dollars every year in tax breaks and subsidies in order to destroy our planet? Why does it happen that the pharmaceutical industry receives huge tax breaks and subsidies while they charge us the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. And everybody in this room knows about the opioid epidemic because New Hampshire has suffered as badly as any state. And understand that the opioid manufacturers, when they learned or knew that the products that they were selling were addictive and killing people, do you know what they did? They hired more salespeople. That's what they did. Corruption, greed of an extraordinary level. Now, why is that? How does all that happen? Well, it takes us back to a fundamental principle of money in politics. Money in politics. So right now, you have a billionaire president who is a pathological liar, who is corrupt, who is a racist, a sexist, a homophobe, a xenophobe, and a religious bigot. But big money interests are not unhappy with this guy. He's OK. Many of these corporations are not unhappy with him. He gave them huge tax breaks. Two years ago, he gave a trillion dollars in tax breaks to the wealthiest 1% and large profitable corporations, such that Companies like Amazon, owned by the wealthiest guy in America, last year paid zero in federal income taxes less than you paid. How does that happen? Why does that happen? And the answer is that we have a corrupt political system. That's the simple fact. It's a system, and I know this is hard stuff, and I know people don't want to hear it, and I know people say, Bernie, I you know, just don't want to hear it. But we've got to talk about it, because the future of democracy is at stake in this election, actually. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a president who's a billionaire who promised during his campaign, oh, his tax bill, you all remember that, wasn't going to benefit the rich. It was going to benefit working families. Well, over a 10-year period, 83% of the benefits went to the top 1%. And when you talk about money in politics, we got a former mayor of New York City who has a record, every reason in the world he's entitled to run for president. No problem with that. Smart guy. But he is spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to buy the election. There is something wrong with that. As a candidate, let him run. That's fine. Everybody want to run for president, run for president. How do we feel about living in a so-called democracy when a billionaire, multi-billionaire, 55 billion, can spend unlimited sums of money? How do we feel when we have candidates in the Democratic Party right now? And I'm reading some headlines from newspapers about Pete Buttigieg. Pete Buttigieg has most exclusive billionaire donors of any Democrat. That's, that was from Forbes, The Hill. Pete Buttigieg tops billionaire donor list. Fortune. Pete Buttigieg takes lead as big business candidate in 2020 field, Washington Post. The finance, uh, Pete Buttigieg's lures even closer to look from Wall Street donors following strong Iowa caucus performance. Forbes magazine, here are the billionaires backing Pete Buttigieg's presidential campaign. I like Pete Buttigieg, nice guy. But we are in a moment where billionaires control not only our economy, but our political life. And let me tell you something, I'm very proud of the campaign we're running in many, many respects. Proud of the great victory we won in Iowa. We won by over 6,000 votes. But I'll tell you what I'm most proud of. I am most proud that at this particular moment in this campaign, we have received more campaign contributions, over 6 million contributions, from more people, over a million and a half people, averaging $18 a piece, than any candidate in the history of American politics. And I'm enormously proud of that. What does that say? What that says, and I say this with enormous pride, is that this is a campaign 
of the working families of America. We are funded by the working class of this country. The profession that funds our campaign most, you know, it's not Wall Street, it's not the drug companies, not the insurance companies, it is teachers. It is workers from Walmart, workers from Target. I help those people in Wal I help those people in Amazon, help people at Disney get at least a $15 minimum wage, and those people who have no money are kicking in 10, 20 bucks in our campaign. So here's what the whole campaign is about. It's not every, I can give you a list of the 50 different proposals that we brought forth tonight. They're on our website, check them out. But that campaign is more than that. This campaign is about which side are you on? That's an old Woody Guthrie song. Anyone remember old Woody Guthrie? He wrote a song which I will not sing for you. You would not want to hear it. But basically, what is, which side are you on? And right now, we need policies in Washington that reflect the needs of the working families of this country who have been too, too long neglected. We need to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour. We need to tell the wealthy and the powerful they will start paying their fair share of taxes. We need to make public colleges and universities tuition free and cancel all student debt with a modest tax on Wall Street speculation. We certainly need to end this dysfunctional and cruel health care system and pass Medicare for all. We need not to ignore the existential threat of climate change, but lead the world in transforming our energy system and telling the fossil fuel industry that their short-term profits are not more important than the future of this planet. But to do all of that stuff, we are going to need a government that unapologetically represents working people and not wealthy corporations, not billionaires. And that is what this campaign is about. Now, you may disagree with me on this issue. Fine. I don't think everything that we say is 100% correct. It needs discussion. Nobody has all of the answers. But that's basically the issue. Whose side are you on? Do you think if you're collecting money from dozens and dozens of billionaires, you're going to stand up to the drug companies? And you're going to throw their CEOs in jail if they have acted criminally in killing people all over this country with opioids that they knew were addictive and killing people. Think that's going to happen? If you're taking money from the healthcare industry, you think you're going to take them on and say, hey, guess what? The United States will join every other major country on earth and guarantee healthcare is a human right, not a privilege. You think you're going to take on the fast food industry and say, you know what? Pay your workers a living wage, at least 15 bucks an hour. You think you're going to stand with the unions of this country and make it easier for workers to join unions and earn decent wages and benefits. Think you're going to take on the fossil fuel industry whose product is destroying this land. That is what this campaign is about. It's not about this issue. Tonight I'll be in a debate and I'll ask us 500 questions about this issue, that issue, and that's fine. You've got to hear the answers. But it's deeper than that. Which side are you on? Are you on the side of a working class of this country, which has been batted for the last 45 years? Are you willing to take on the greed and corruption of the billionaire class and the 1%, or will you continue to stand with the big money interest? That is what this campaign is about. And as somebody who is the son of the working class, somebody whose father came to this country at the age of 17 without a nickel in his pocket, couldn't speak a word of English, had no education, very limited education, never made any money in his life, grew up in a rent-controlled apartment. I apologize to nobody in my desire to stand with the working families of this country. Thank you all very much. schedule, uh, but we have time for a couple of questions. If I could just ask the first question. First of all, uh, Senator, thank you very much for your uh, disability rights plan that you have incorporated in your agenda. This is the 30th anniversary of the Americans Disability Act. I just want to thank you uh, on behalf of the disabled community. Um, also, there are personal care attendants who take care of people with disability are leaving the field to work at McDonald's because they get a higher ra right. a wage at McDonald's than they would as a care, personal care attendant. So we need to address that, a national disgrace. My question to you, Senator, is if you're elected uh, president, you've indicated you're considering 
issuing dozens of executive orders. Can you announce a couple of your priorities? Yes. Thank you very much. All of you know that a president, uh, through the pen and executive orders, has a certain amount of power. Uh, most of the important stuff is done through legislation, but you can do a lot of important things. Number one, in terms of executive orders, on day one, we will rescind all of Trump's racist immigration executive orders. And that means, that means that on day one, among other things, we will reestablish the legal protection for the 1.8 million young people eligible for the DACA program. We can do that on day one. On day one, we will undo the damage that Trump has done in terms of the Mexico City Agreement and make sure that the United States can fund and will fund organizations all over the world who support women's reproductive rights. <laughs> On day one, I know this seems fairly radical, but you can do it, we will be able to take marijuana out of the Controlled Substance Act. Right now, marijuana is at the same level as heroin, which is pretty insane. We do that, and essentially, we legalize marijuana in every state in this country on day one, which is part of our criminal justice reform effort. On day one, we say to federal contractors, and I work really hard on this over the years, but we say to federal contractors, if you want a federal contract, you have to pay your workers at least $15 an hour. Now, that's the morning. We really get to work in the afternoon, but. OK. We got Haley, who's a student here at St. Age, who has the microphone. So be patient and just uh, uh, identify yourself. And hopefully, you're a New Hampshire voter. Uh, that would be very helpful. Sir, you have a hand up. Just wait for the microphone. Good morning. My name is Mike Tversky, and I work at New England College. So I'm happy to be here today. Thank you for taking time today. Um, I am a New Hampshire voter, and fortunately for living in New Hampshire, we get to meet all the candidates in very close quarters like this, sometimes even one-on-one. -on -one. And we hear a lot of talk, um, and I'm not criticizing what you said today. It's great to hear um, what you've said. And a lot of what I heard you say today was really listening to folks and working for working Americans. You've been on the road a lot, so I'd like to know if you could give us a specific example of how you've adjusted your policy or your position on something based on actually listening to us and how that'll affect your presidency. Good. I have been on the road a lot. Uh, and thank you for your question. Uh, my campaign was interrupted a little bit with the impeachment process of uh, President Trump. Um, but I have been on the road. And I'll tell you what, one of the things that I have learned going around the country. Vermont and New Hampshire are primarily white states. That's the fact. But you go to states in the South, you go to California, you go to Nevada, you hear different things. I did not fully appreciate, until I ran for president, to be honest with you, how corrupt and racist our criminal justice system is. Okay? I did not know. I mean, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this, because maybe many of you knew it. Maybe some of you don't. That today in America, as we speak at this moment, there are 400,000 people behind bars right now who have not been convicted of anything. We have 2 million people plus in jail. 20% of them are behind bars having not been convicted of anything. Why are they behind bars? Who knows? Well, so if you're rich, you commit a crime, hey, lawyer, get me out of here, $50,000 bail, sign I'm out. You're convicted or charged with shoplifting. You go to jail. I can't afford the $500 bail. I didn't know that, OK? I did not know the toll that the so-called war on drugs has done to families, primarily African American, Latino, and Native Americans. You got arrested, cop stops you, you got arrested, possession of marijuana. You have a criminal record. You go out and you get a job. Hi, have you ever been arrested? Oh, uh, yes, I have been arrested, sir. Well, I'm sorry, we got other candidates for your job. I don't get a job. If I don't get a job, how am I going to get any income? Right? I learned, I would say criminal justice is something that I learned a lot about. Immigration, you know, we don't have huge Latino populations in Vermont and New Hampshire. I learned a little bit. I'll never forget as long as I live, being in Phoenix, Arizona, talking to a half a dozen teenage kids, Latino kids. Tears coming out of their eyes because they were worried that when they went home, 
their mom or dad might not be in the house. Talking to a kid who recall, recalled a story. His father was in the car speeding. Cop, police officer stopped the car. Everybody's heart stopped beating in the car because all the police officer had to do was ask for papers. And fortunately, the police officer did not. Their family would have been destroyed. So those are some of the things that I've learned going around the country. We have uh, Lenny Glenn. Lenny, I have a luncheon, so let's make <laughs> <laughs> Senator, thank you very much. I'm from Massachusetts, but I'm also an American voter. <clears throat> I think there's a lot of people in this room that share your anger and your anxiety and your rage at the conditions you've just mentioned, all of them. <clears throat> but there's a question in a lot of our minds. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the British Labour Party, just took them. He's very similar ideologically and politically to you, I think. And he took them to the worst defeat they've had in half a century. How can you assure us that you would not face the same onslaught and you'd be able to overcome it somehow uh, and, and, and win, as opposed to Donald Trump claims he'd love to run against you? Any other softball questions? <laughs> well, I know Donald Trump Pardon, excuse claims. Me, excuse me for the I'm, tough one. I, I apologize. No, but. no, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. We're here to. I love tough questions. I mean, that's what we're here to do, have a serious discussion. And we're going to ignore the 800 cameras behind us, and we'll just have an intimate little discussion here. Um, Donald Trump says that he would love to run against Bernie Sanders. Well, maybe not. Donald Trump lies a whole lot of the time. Uh, and in fact, what I have read is some of his advisors tell him that I will be the toughest candidate for him to run against. Here's how I think, Lenny, we beat Donald Trump. And I am, and, and let me, before I even say that, let me just be clear. Obviously, I am working as hard as I can to become the Democratic nominee. So are the other candidates out there, most of whom are my friends. Okay, I've known Elizabeth for 20 plus years, Joe for 15 years, Amy for 16 years. These are my friends, okay? They're trying hard. I think they would all say what I'm going to say to you now. And that is, no matter who wins this nomination, obviously I hope it's myself, all of us will get behind the winner and do everything we humanly can to defeat this most dangerous president. So that, that's, that's the first point. We all understand. We have differences, of course. But our differences pale, pale to the differences we have with this president. Number two, lay it on the line here, and how do you defeat somebody like Trump? Is Trump gonna be an easy opponent? No, he's gonna be a very, very difficult opponent for a whole lot of reasons. In my view, you do not defeat Trump unless you have the largest voter turnout in the history of this country. And that means bringing out not only people who traditionally vote. My guess is, Lenny, every two years, every four years, you're out voting, right? And that's what you should be. That's what, that's what we all do, most of us do. But there are a lot of people in this country who do not vote, who vote infrequently. In fact, we have one of the lowest voter turnouts of any major country on Earth. So I want you to think, Lenny, if we believe that a large voter turnout is necessary, what campaign has the capability of reaching out effectively to what we call non-traditional voters. Now, the Iowa caucus is behind us. And I'm supposed to stand here, OK. The Iowa caucus is behind us. And while the voter turnout there was not as high as I had liked, you know what did happen? We saw a 30% increase in young people under 29 voting. If we're going to defeat Trump, we need a huge increase in young people's participation in the political process. We need to be able to reach out to some of Trump's working class supporters and make it clear that they understand the fraud that he is. We need to reach out to low income and working class people who traditionally do not vote. And Lenny, to be honest with you, 
I think we are the candidate. We are a multi-generational, multi-racial campaign that has the capability of reaching out to communities all across this country, bring them into the political process, and defeat Trump. So that's kind of my view. We have a, uh, a question from the New Hampshire AAP. Karen? Thank you, Senator Sanders, for being with us today, and thank your gracious wife for being here also. The question I have for you concerns all ages and also rich and poor. It goes across the spectrum of all of those and in between, and that is the high cost of our prescription drugs. So if you are elected president, what is the first thing you will do to lower the price of prescription drugs? Now, Karen, how many hours do we have for me to answer that? <laughs> See, often in my office, there is a debate. And that is, which entity in America is the most corrupt? Is it Wall Street or the pharmaceutical industry? We're not quite sure. I lean toward the pharmaceutical industry. Okay? Now. Let's be clear. Karen's question is enormously important for New Hampshire and for the whole country, okay? Why do we pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs? Why is it that last year I took a number of folks from the Midwest over the Canadian border who were diabetics to buy insulin? Karen, you know the differential in price for the same exact product in Canada compared to the United States and insulin? You know what it is? 10 to 1. Do you know that in the United States, a quarter of our people who are on insulin are rationing their dosages? How insane is that? One out of five Americans cannot afford the high price of prescription drugs that doctors prescribe. How does that happen? Well, among other things, it happens because the drug companies today can charge any price they want. It's not against the law. They want to double the medicine you've been using for 20 years? Of course they can. That's what the market will bill. They'll do it. So what if you're paying 10 times more than they pay in the UK or France? And this has to do with corruption and price fixing, among other things. In terms of insulin, they always raise their prices to a handful of companies. But mostly it has to do with, over the last 20 years, the drug companies putting $4 billion into lobbying and campaign contributions. Go to the internet, find out where they're putting them. Almost all, or most, Republicans and Democrats get money from the pharma, from the pharmaceutical industry, including some of my opponents in this race. So to answer your question, what do we do? We're going to do two things. Number one, there are three ways that we can lower prescription drugs, at least three. Number one, on day one, you asked me what I do on day one. One of the other things we could do is what we call reimportation. Right now, when you go to dinner tonight, the food that you get comes from all over the world. Yet somehow or another, we're not to allow your pharmacists or distributors Prescription drug distributors can't reinforce, reimport safe FDA-approved drugs a few miles away from Canada, where the price might be one-tenth the price. Can't do that, says the government. That's nonsense. Of course you can do that. And that you can do, by the way, through a stroke of the pen. Means your pharmacists, your prescription drug distributors, can get safe FDA-approved medicine from all over the world, bring it into this country. Second of all, we can do what the Canadians do. And we say to the drug companies, we're going to average out what you're paying and charging people in Japan, in France, in Sweden, in Mexico. That's what you're going to pay, charge in the United States. Third thing, of course, is we have Medicare negotiate prices with the drug companies. So it's no longer, we already have that with the Veterans Administration. The pricing system in the pharmaceutical industry is so insanely complex. This hospital will pay that, you will pay that, this doctor will pay that, it is completely opaque and insane. But when you have Medicare saying, guess what? We represent, we're spending billions of dollars on drugs. This is what you're going to charge us. Changes the whole dynamic. The VA already does it. Medicare does not. Under the reason, why, is, why do we pay so much more? Because every other major country has a national health care program. That's what the Canadians do. They sit down and they negotiate. We don't. So what we will do is lower drug prices in this country very, very significantly. And as part of Medicare for all, because we've lowered drug prices, nobody in America on our plan will pay more than $200 a year for the prescription drugs they need. So right now, one out of five Americans who goes to the doctor cannot afford to fill 
the prescriptions the doctors write. How insane is that? That will change. We will finally take on the greed and the corruption. But I, I use the word corruption advisedly. Massive amounts of price fixing and bribery that goes on in that industry. That is a bad news industry, and people in America are dying. So I don't take any money. Unlike some of my opponents, I don't take money from the drug companies. Under our administration, if there's one thing we will accomplish, is taking these guys on and substantially lowering the cost of prescription drugs. We're running uh, about five minutes before we have to adjourn, so the young lady here. This might be a softball, so thanks you, thank you so much for being here today. I love softball questions. <laughs> Good. Um, so, and again, thank you for being here. You're a wonderful, wonderful person. <laughs> um, so I have a question about housing. I work a corporate career, live frugal, frugally, and save about 70% of my discretionary income, yet even I struggle rationalizing living in a one-bedroom apartment on my own because all of the housing available are luxury apartments, $2,500 a month. Absolutely insane. I just want a place that's safe and someone that I can call my own. Um, when you're president, is there anything you can do to create more affordable housing for the middle class? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we have a, a major proposal uh, in there. Uh, you know, the gentleman here asked what I've learned around the country. Uh, and one of the other crises that I, I learned is, is housing. I know my own city in Burlington, uh, price of housing is, is very, very high. Uh, you go to San Francisco, I mean, you've got to be a, a millionaire to live in this. I'm exaggerating a little bit. Seattle, you've got massive amounts of homelessness. So what you're talking about housing, number one, in the richest country in the world, half a million people living out on the streets. Number two, as a result of gentrification, where developers say, hey, why do I want to build affordable housing when I can make twice as much money building expensive housing so that you have teachers and workers who cannot afford to live in the neighborhoods they grew up so to answer your question, we have a very, very major housing proposal, which will build up to 10 million units of affordable housing. Okay, And we think that would lower the cost of housing uh, for working people all over this country. And by the way, when you do that, when we talk about infrastructure, and everybody here knows that our infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, water systems, man, that's another issue I learned a lot about. Did not know that severe water problems all over this country in terms of the quality of water. I talk about housing as part of that infrastructure. We can put millions of people to work building the kind of affordable housing that we need. So your question is spot on. It's a crisis. We've got to address it. We have a proposal, proposal to do that. Maybe one final question in the back. Just a quick question. Yeah, all the way in the back. Thank you, Senator. I'm Rob Werner. I'm the State Director for the League of Conservation Voters here in New Hampshire. Thanks for centering climate change so much in your campaign. How would you elevate climate and environmental justice in your administration? Look, on this issue, you know, I, I don't want to waste too much time talking about Trump. Uh, but the disservice that he does to the people of our own country and to the entire world is incalculable. Everybody in this room knows, I hope, that what the scientists are now telling us is that they have underestimated, am I right, Rob? They have underestimated the degree and severity and speed in which climate change is wrecking, wreaking havoc in our country and the planet. Am I right or not on that, Rob? All right. So we are fighting for the future of this planet. I've got Four kids and seven beautiful grandchildren, three of whom live right here in New Hampshire. We have a moral responsibility to make sure the planet we leave them is healthy and habitable. And the problem, as Rob well knows, is this is not just an American issue, it's a global issue. So as President of the United States, we will not only place this at the very highest level, because we have to, but we will reach out to the people of China and Russia and India Brazil, countries all over the world, <clears throat> and make the idea, I know this is a radical idea, but maybe, just maybe, instead of spending $1.8 trillion a year on weapons of destruction designed to kill each other, maybe we should pool our resources and fight our common enemy, which is climate change.
take one final question? I think we're okay. Whatever you want. Yes, ma'am. Young lady here, and then we'll <coughs> in the back. Hi, Senator Sanders. My name is Kira Curley. I'm a student. Um, I just want to thank you for seeing the working class man and um, truly empathizing and advocating for us. Uh, secondly, um, how will you ensure everyone will have access to quality reproductive care regardless of class, money, race, gender expression, Good. or sex sexuality? You know, thank you very much. I'm a senator, so I'm on the floor of the Senate occasionally, and I listen to a lot of speeches. That is when I'm in Washington and not in New Hampshire. And I listen to a lot of speeches from conservative Republicans. So I kind of know what their mantra is. Here's their mantra. They believe in small government. They're going to deregulate everything, privatize everything. And by the way, they want to get the government, that big bad government, out of the lives of the American people. Right? You're going to do what you want to do. Except if you are a woman. So you have these hypocrites talking about getting the government out of the lives of the American people, and they think they have the right to tell every woman in America what she can do with her body. So let me tell you what we will do. Number one, as quickly as we can, we will codify Roe v. Wade, put it into law. Number two, we will expand funding for Planned Parenthood so that women, regardless of income, Planned Parenthood does a great job in reproductive rights, regardless of income, will be able to get the assistance that they need. And number three, here's my promise to you. We will never, ever nominate anybody to the Supreme Court or to the federal courts who is not 100% pro Roe v. Wade. Okay, the student in the back, that'll be the final question. Thank you, Senator Sanders, for being here this rainy morning. I'm Sean, I'm a student here. I just wanted to ask you about voter participation. You mentioned how you want to have the highest voter participation yep. in this election, yet there are so many barriers for voters, especially for people who are economically disadvantaged and for racial minorities. So I was just wondering how you would alleviate that. Thank you very much for that very important question. You know, as all of you know, because we're neighbors, I have run for office in Vermont a whole lot. And when I was younger, I lost. I've been winning mostly in recent years. We've been in, but I've lost elections. But what I can tell you, it has never, ever occurred to me as a candidate in the state of Vermont to sit down and think, OK, you know, we're strong in certain areas, and like every candidate, we're weaker in other areas. It's never occurred to me to say, OK, we're weak in those areas. How can I make it harder for those people to vote? But I have always believed if I cannot win an election based on my ideas, then I shouldn't win the election. Okay? And one of the ugly, disgraceful things that's happening in America today is you have cowardly Republican governors and secretaries of state all over this country who are intentionally suppressing the vote, who are trying to make it harder for people of color, for poor people, and for young people, by the way, to participate in the political process. Now, how cowardly can you be if you don't think your ideas are going to prevail to get out of politics and get another job? But don't try to make it harder for people to participate. So to answer your question, you know, what we will do is make it very clear through legislation and through maybe, if necessary, a, a constitutional amendment. If you're 18 years of age in America, you are a citizen, you have the right to vote, end of discussion. And we're gonna deal with this excessive gerrymandering that takes place, which denies people one person, one vote. And obviously, we have to deal with campaign finance, and we have to overturn Citizens United, because we don't want big money interests to continue to buy elections. So those are some of the things that we have to do. Thanks very much for your question.